When you take the truth of the Bible regarding things in the future, and I have in mind specifically the day of the final judgment of all men when this world has ended. As I said before, that may sound like Star Wars, or it may sound like fantasy Middle Earth, Gandalf, Goff, and Hobbits, and Elves, and all of that. But the Bible be the infallible, inerrant, and all-sufficient, and final revelation of God to man. Then it tells us there is that day coming. And it's good for us to be mindful of the fact that there will be no secrets from God, even as there are no secrets now. That there's going to be a time when we have to give an account of our actions to God. At the end of the age, Paul says it ought to be a time of comfort for those who have loved the Lord and kept His commandments. And so he writes to the Thessalonians in the first chapter of the second epistle, beginning in verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Speaking of Christians being troubled. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Then he speaks of Christians on that day in verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed, in that day. There's no way, even if we fathom considerable amount or all of what the Bible has to say about the day of judgment, to get a full grasp of that. I, I can't fathom all people who have ever lived under patriarchy, under the law of Moses, however long the world goes into the future, under the authority of Christ in the New Testament from the first century till now, and as I said, into the future. All those people assembled. The Lord says that he will divide the saved from the lost as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. Again, that's beyond me that you could have all those multiplied billions of people and be a, quote, place, unquote, to where that could happen. But the Bible says it is. If I can believe Acts 2.38 concerning being baptized for the remission of sins, I can believe everything else about what it says, even that which has not happened and will happen in the future at some point. This day of judgment is a time of sentencing. That's what the word judgment means. It is not a time when you get there wondering if you're going to hell or not. You have to wait till he tells you. It is a time of the judge on his judgment seat meeting out the sentence to those who are lost and to those who are saved. The merciful Savior, who is God, and thus omniscient, knowing all that is the object of knowledge, he who is the Son of Man, so he's been here, done that, but he's God too. And thus he can judge us as God and judge us as man, actually having gone through that is, tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. When you look at what the Bible says about the judgment, it will say the day of judgment, but it also calls it the day of the Lord in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. And there the inspired Peter writing to Christians said, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
Then he makes an application that should be good for all of us. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, in other words, the whole physical material creation is gone, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation, the way you live and godliness, being right with God according to the truth? That should cause any serious-minded person to stop and say, what am I doing with my life? How am I living it? How am I planning it? Have I made plans in the past that need to be changed? Do I need to change my plans? Everybody that obeys the gospel at the stage of repentance is saying, yes, I do. I must change and follow after the things of God. In 1 John 4, 17, it's just simply called the day of judgment. In Jude 6, where he talks about angels that left their first estate and how they're reserved in chains, he says they're reserved to that great day, Jude 6. It's referenced also as the day of the Lord Jesus, as Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 1, verses 6 and 10. And as we read here in 2 Thessalonians, it will be a day of wrath. Paul also uses that expression in Romans chapter 2 and verse 5. And then as we quoted this morning and have often quoted, it's the last day. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now it will be noted that all of these passages have come from books written to Christians. They heard the gospel. They believed it. They repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ, and they were baptized into Christ. Why then must we hear the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the great day, the day of the Lord Jesus, the day of wrath? Well, first of all, two reasons. For the child of God, it says, don't give up doing what you already know is right. Whatever happens around you doesn't change what the Bible says doesn't change the terms of salvation, doesn't change the will of heaven. And then it also tells us that nobody escapes this day of judgment. And we'll notice that more a little later. And it should remind the person who knows they're not a Christian, who are still dead in their trespasses and sin, who are still living on the level of this world, that this world's leaving. We hear so much about uh, how the world's heating up. Well, it heats up, as we read a while ago, to the point of the elements melting with fervent heat, but it'll be by the will of God that it will, and it'll be brought on directly by Him to destroy the world because all things here have fulfilled their place. So the Bible has much to say about that day of God meeting out sentences to people according to how they lived on this earth, what they did with their life. It never hurts when we approach the Bible and contemplate our own thinking, our own planning, our own purposing, uh, the day-to-day -day lives that we live and so on, our associations with others, how we treat them. The Bible has much to say about that as a mark of a Christian. It never hurts to, to realize all of that's coming down to this one day. That there is a certain way to live that God sanctions. No one can just live any way they want to. We often hear that in our world. Just let me do what I want to. I saw a sign the other day that says, The person is truly free who lives as he wants to. <laughs> First of all, I don't believe there's anybody like that. You may attempt to do that, but I seriously doubt anybody can just, if they're of that mindset, live just as they want to. That is a separate part from everybody, just doing as they please, without involving themselves with anybody. No man's an island to himself. No way. Even if you go off on one of these uh, wildlife show things up to Alaska, and you're out there a million miles from nowhere, have you ever noticed how those folks depend so much on modern conveniences? I see them using gasoline out there and talking how they rough it. wonder where they go get the gasoline. And then some of them are flying airplanes up there, the Bushmen of Alaska. wonder where they got that. Now, if they really wanted to rough it, they ought to go up there and live like they did in 1850, see how long they last. 
So we all benefit from the work of others and association with others, even when we're not personally around them. But when it comes to God, it's, God, it's God's way or eternal destruction. A lot of people can't stand that. One of the reasons that people come up with there is no God and that everything comes by multiplied millions of years of chance evolution with everything coming from nothing and to where it is today is because they do not want to acknowledge God because if they do, they're smart enough to know they're accountable to him because they're one of his creatures. So there is this day of judgment. We would do well to remember it and call it to the attention of others as we strive to get them to come to Christ. This judgment is a certainty. I mentioned that in the beginning. Acts 17, 31, Paul preaching to those pagans and philosophers on Mars Hill said that that day of judgment is coming as surely as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And of course, those people mocked him. Some of them did at that time. But there's no use saying, well, this is just uh, some babbling preacher. You know, they said that about Paul. The little Greek means from those philosophers, they would call him a seed picker. He really hadn't got a lot to offer. He wasn't from Harvard or Yale or Oxford or Cambridge. So what's he got to offer? 2 Corinthians 5.10, there is a must, must imperative that we all appear in the judgment to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Some people think that Christians, because they're covered by the blood of Christ and they die, their sins remitted, 1 John 1.7, that they won't have to give an account. But that's not what this passage says, 2 Corinthians 5.10. He says we will give an account of ourselves according to what we've done, good or bad. Now it is true that the person who dies covered by the blood of Christ, that is faithful to him, is going to be saved. But he's still going to mete out judgment on the basis of that person. That is what he's done. Remember the Bible talking about how that uh, people are full of good works, the faithful? So yes, people in the church are full of good works if they're faithful. But even then, there are different ones of us who are, are more involved in the sense of knowledge of the Bible and ability and talents. So there can't be a meeting out according to our works until the place where our works was done is over and done with and they have no more influence, whether it's good or bad. Then there can be a judgment. It may come as a surprise to some people to realize that when they're dead and gone, they still leave a good or bad influence behind. Some leave that bad influence behind by writing books that teach good things, and others by writing books that teach bad things. And by people left behind reading them, they do bad things or good things. So we must remember there can be no final judgment till there is a final judgment. <laughs> There's no more place for your works, good or bad, to influence anybody. It's all over and done with. And we must all appear before the judgment. There's no dodging it. There's no getting around it. It's sort of like people on uh, jury duty. You know, they always got reasons they can't be on jury duty. But there won't be anything like that when it comes to our standing all by ourselves, all alone before the judgment seat of Christ, to give an account of the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Peter speaks to the church in 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. And he's talking about the same thing. And he talks about judgment beginning first with Christians, beginning with us. And then he says, if it first began with us, what's going to be the end of those who don't obey the gospel? And that fits in with what Paul said, that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged according to our conduct on this world. The books will be open. What books? Well, I know that the standard of life, as far as Jesus is concerned, as far as Christians are concerned, is the New Testament. We've already caught, uh, quoted verses that said that. But there's the book of life. There's the book that records your deeds. Those not found written in the book of life are lost. They're not going to be saved. If you read the book of Revelation, you'll see that very clearly. Because Revelation 20, 12 through 14, he talks about books, plural, will be opened. And you say, you mean they're actually going to have a literal book? I don't know. But a book, writing, has always been that which means permanent. A permanent record. And that's the idea. 
There's a permanent record God keeps of your life. You ever notice how many times a lot of people are always talking about, well, so-and-so and so-and-so is doing this, and so-and-so and so-and-so is not doing that? Or why did he do this to that, and why did she do that to this, and all this stuff? You ever notice how we transfer guilt? I don't see a lot of times transference of good, but you, you watch people. They will not take the blame for what they do, but they can shift the blame. I don't see that much happening for good that people do, and they shift and give credit to somebody else for the good they did. We're always shifting blame, but you don't. In fact, that shifting blame fits. You don't hear shifting good. That doesn't fit, does it? And you had it starting in the beginning when Adam tried to abdicate his responsibility as the head of the human race and actually told God about Eve's sin because he had partaken of it without even considering what he was taking off. She was tempted to sin. Adam just, eyes wide open, took it from her and ate it. But then he said to God, the woman thou gavest me, she did give me and I did eat. He shifted the blame. But he didn't shift it to the woman. He shifted it to God. Because where did he get the woman? I think it's always been interesting that when you read about the creation that you'll see day one, day two, day three, so forth, and it'll say it was good when it finished. You ever notice he doesn't say it was very good that after created the woman? Uh, we men don't like to admit that. But that's when he said it was truly good. It was after he created man. He created his suitable help. No other creature on this earth is specially created to stand by the man as a wife, except the woman. Then he said, at the end of all creation, when the woman is created, it's very good. Might fathom those things a little bit and see what it says. But the woman, because she was very good and had this special influence on him, well, he abdicated his responsibility as the head of the human race. You know, where was Adam when she was being tempted? It was in his recliner watching television. So the point is, he abdicated his responsibility, and then he shifted the blame. Well, God, if you had given me her, I wouldn't have sinned. And yet just earlier it says, when he sees her after he wakes up, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Happy day, then. But that didn't remove the responsibility God assigned to him that wasn't her responsibility. And it didn't remove the responsibility assigned to her as his suitable help. You see, she should have listened, and he should have too. They both shared in the blame. Well, now think about that when it comes down through the stream of time and everybody else. There's no use trying to pass a buck. Every one of us are responsible for our lives. What we do, what we don't do, who we do it with. And there's no use saying, the wife or the husband, he's the reason I'm not what I ought to be, and I'm unfulfilled. And he can't say, well, she's not the young thing I married 30, 40 years ago, and I need to have somebody else. You know, she turns 40, needs a pair of 20s, all that kind of rigmarole. But that's the, you know, we laugh about that as Christians and following the truth. The world thinks that way. Do you keep up with what's being put out concerning marriage? Do you realize that the television shows sometimes show us the effort at propaganda and getting us used to all sorts of things that are contrary to marriage? I saw one the other day or watched part of it to where here was a man who was in the hospital and here was his wife who had Alzheimer's and wasn't too at it, but then here was the other woman who had agreed to live with him as a wife, take care of him and his wife. Now, do you think that's just simply on there for entertainment? If you do, you don't understand television and its influence. Or where you might have a man married to two women, regardless of their health. You say, oh, I don't know about that. Have you ever heard of Muslims? Why do you think we can get all of this country primed to accept homosexuality and all of that and not have polygamous marriages also come along. 
Why would we say, oh, this is terrible? But over here, if you just identify a, with a roadrunner, then that's what you are. If you, if you create that kind of mentality, how are you going to have anything in society or the laws of the land eventually condone a Matthew 19, 6 marriage? One that God joins together, two people that are eligible for marriage. You're not. You're conditioning. You know, one of the best things we can do sometimes, if we even know who he is, is go back and study Dr. Goebbels under the Nazis, who was the propaganda minister. You know one of the things he taught? When you're blamed as something, turn it around and say it's their fault, even though it's yours, and put the blame back on them. Talk about transference. He did that, they did that to a whole society. Then everything bad, you blamed on the Jews. All the problems, economically and everything else, you blame it on the Jews. And you keep talking it up, talking it up. And guess what? It changes. Change the whole society. How do these things happen? I can't believe that could happen. Rather than those of us who are at least my age can remember when, there, when, when abortion was not legal. And there were people saying that oh, that'll never happen. Well, once it did, then you know what they said? Oh, there'll never be homosexual marriages. Well, they've gone far beyond that, and it's being regularly put out and accepted. And the young people are going to grow up with that. It'll be just as natural in their thinking as anything else. That's how propaganda works. And sometimes we don't even want to address it in the home or from the pulpit in the classroom. So all of that's going to be dealt with someday. The judgment of God, or Christ, if you please, is going to be righteous judgment, 1 Peter 2 and verse 23. There won't be shifting blame, as I said earlier. There won't be, well, it felt this way. Uh, you just don't understand. you got to understand this, that, and the other. No, it's either do what God said do in the way he said do it or the reason, or you disobeyed him. We make all sorts of these things up because it's all designed to justify us in doing evil and still think God will save us. It's just not that way. It's not in the Bible. Truth is truth and never will be truth, regardless of what anybody thinks about it or don't think about it. It's just the way that nature of truth. Every deed, every deed is to be judged, Romans 3, 5 through 6. I said earlier in the very beginning there are no secrets. So judge will judge, God will judge the secrets of men, Romans 2, 6 not going to be a secret. Keep that in mind. When you think like you'd like to kill your husband, and you mean it if you just get the chance to not go to jail with it, that's going to come out. Or wife. Or your kids. Especially teenagers. <laughs> you know, you can't do that. Now you say, oh, no, that wouldn't happen. Do you watch your news? Do you see what people do to little kids? How do they do it? I can't believe people do that. Believe it. There's the facts. Can't think they do little kids that way. They do it every day. Now, you can have all sorts of, in your mind, reasons you did it. Now, I knocked him in the head with the hatchet. I didn't mean it. If the kid walked in front of me and I was swinging the hatchet and just hit him in the head and he died, I'm sorry about that. Such stuff as that. And he's going to judge everybody at his appearing, according to what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Judging everyone. Notice how that this is designed to say there is no escape. Now you get sent to Huntsville. You might escape. <laughs> Few even able to do that. But anybody that does will not escape this judgment. Because every single solitary person who's ever lived will be there. Notice we talked about the day of judgment. It's a certainty how that God or Christ is going to be the judge, and that everyone is going to be judged. But it begins with the Lord's church. Each one will give an account of the deeds done in the body. He's going to judge, according to 2 Timothy 4, 1, the living and the dead. What does that mean? Well, if you're alive, it is coming. You never go through death. You're just transformed. But all those that are dead, he's going to deal with. He's also going to go, it can be looked at from this way. Those living in the sense that they're spiritually alive through faithful service to God and those that are separated from God in that sense of being dead. That, that, it's just another way of saying you can't escape. 
You see all these people in Washington and other capitals of the world and all these big shots and multimillionaires. You see all the glitter and fakeness of Hollywood and all of that. They won't escape. They will not escape. Well, what's going to happen on that day? Well, we said judgment. We said people give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. But I learned from 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, that he's even going to judge angels. I don't understand all of that. All, I just know he's going to pass sentence on certain angels. And I know also from Jude 6 that there are those angels that did not keep their first estate. Don't even know all about that. They just didn't abide where God put them, and they're reserved in change of darkness to the great day of judgment is what it's saying. A good deity, God, the best definition of deity is the one single divine essence made up of three persons. It's not like three people getting together. It's that very essence has three persons in it. And thus God through Christ is going to judge the world. So Paul said, as we referred to earlier in Acts 17, 31 on Mars Hill. I've already read uh, how that the heavens and earth will pass away. Can you conceive of that? And it will pass away with a great noise. I mean, it will be a noise. Can you conceive of all, let's go out some night and look up and think about this world. Think about everything you can see now through your five senses, empirical knowledge, gone. Everything passes away with a great noise. Elements melting with fervent heat. The earth also shall be burned up. So the Lord's going to come with his angels, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. Angels will be judged according to Jude 6. God will judge then through Jesus Christ, Acts 17, 31. The end of time, the heavens and earth will all pass away. Everything, people who have their hope in heavens and earth, it's all coming to an end. It's not going to mean anything. 2 Peter 3, 10. Then the dead will be raised, those that have done good in the resurrection of life, those that have done evil, resurrection of damnation, and they're going to be judged according to their works, Revelation 20, 12 through 15. And I come back to this, the standard, the infallible standard for those under patriarchy will be the law that governed then, such as in the days of Abraham. For those who were faithful Jews, they'll be judged by the law of Moses. Then for those who lived in the Christian age, judged by the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty. And I say again, it will say and mean then at the judgment what it says and means now. Thus, we can prepare ourselves for the judgment by knowing what he says in this divine volume. As we come to the end, while we've looked at the day of judgment, it's a certainty that God judges through Christ, that no one's left out, all are judged. Now what's going to happen on that day is the meeting out of sentence comes to everybody based upon how they conducted their lives. That it's a day of gain to the faithful. And that's the way I want it to come to your mind. We like gain. We like profit. The Christian who dies faithful or is alive faithful when the Lord comes back is going to profit in a way that our minds can't grasp. If you read Paul talking about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, where he corrects errors on the resurrection in the church at Corinth. Or you read about the resurrected body in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Then you just get a bit of a taste, a bit of a whiff of the radical in-depth change between the body we have now and the resurrected body like to Christ. As John said, we do not know what we will be like, but we will be like him. You know, when I read that, that just satisfies me. I don't have to know anything else. And the Bible does say a few things else about the, about the body. But look, you'll be like him. You won't become God. That's impossible. God doesn't begin. But you become like him in his glorified body. In other words, there is no more of this life. There is no more sickness. There is no more sin. There's no more consequences of sin. There are no robbers, there are no thieves, there are no murderers, there are no rapists, there are no funeral homes, there are no hospitals. There's no sickness, there's no death, there's no growing old. And thus we as Christians sing songs that remind us that there's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. The Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by. 
Now, it's wonderful the older you get to have known people who were godly and they've gone on before. And to realize that their very person is still what it was when it was here, it's just not around the physical and it's not in the physical body, it's there. But they're comforted. Do you remember in Luke 16 concerning the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus representing the saved who die, that Abraham tells the rich man who represents the lost that in this life you had your good things, Lazarus' evil things. Now Lazarus is comforted. You realize what all that means? It covers such a broad spectrum of what it means to be comforted. You're relieved of all of this world and its trials and tribulations. And you're now where there is, those things don't exist anymore. But he says then to the rich man who represents the law shall live for himself in this life, and thou art tormented. Remember he's so tormented that he cries out to Abraham, send Lazarus over here with his finger dipped in water. Touch it to my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Why is that in your Bible? What does it tell you about being lost and what awaits you if you die lost? On the other hand, what does it tell us about those who've gone before having lived faithful lives and what there is in store for us? Someday, someday, there'll be a great reunion. I sometimes sit down and contemplate those I have known that as far as my human knowledge is concerned, they died faithful. Can you just see stepping over the River Jordan, as it were? And there those people will greet you. People that you knew when they were in the flesh, like you, in an imperfect manner. But they died in the faith. And now you're reunited. But above that, at the end of the world, when the Hadean world's emptied and we're all resurrected, we'll then possess that glorified body, even like Christ. Now can you imagine walking with Abraham? Isaac and Jacob, visiting with Paul, talking with John, and above all things, walking in the presence of Jesus Christ. Now we can do it. It's not a fantasy. The Bible tells us you have a right to expect that. We're saved by hope, Romans 15, 4. That means expecting what we as faithful Christians have a right to expect because we are faithful when this life's over. Brethren, hope causes us to look beyond the ailments of this life. And through the eye of faith, methinks I see the city four square just across the river. You relieve yourself of a lot of anxiety. All the problems of this world. If with the eye of faith, you'll see things unseen to those who don't know the Bible. There is then that place to die is gain, Philippians 1.24. And there's a crown laid up for me, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. Now are you subject to the gospel call? Do you want to live on the level of the spirit? Do you want to follow Christ that you can be spiritual by obeying his will? Then we urge you to believe with all of your heart that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins and confess your faith in Him and be buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. You do that, the Lord will add you to the church. As a new creature in Christ, you can live faithful and build the hope of heaven in you as you walk the straight and narrow way. Have we lost sight of that sometimes as Christians and we've let the world come back in and cause us not to see afar off? Well, you need to repent of anything like that and Pray God for forgiveness, having confessed those sins. So if you're subject to the blessed and wonderful invitation of our Lord who wants you to be saved, would you come while we stand and sing?